Hello and welcome to another video. So in this video, we'll be talking about the concept of norm. So what is the norm of something? Well, if you ever took a course in physics or anything like that, you may have heard the term magnitude. Well, a norm is just a very fancy way of just saying the same thing. So by definition, the norm is the magnitude of a vector. So more or less, that's what it is. So let me just write that down. So the norm is essentially just the magnitude of a vector. And that is essentially what a norm is. Now, how do you calculate the magnitude of a vector? And before I go on, you can also say, say equivalently that the length of a vector is the same thing as the norm as well. These are both equivalent statements, and they mean the exact same thing. So as a result, you can say these uh, like correspondingly. Okay, now that aside, how do you actually calculate the length of a vector or the norm of a vector? Okay, so suppose I give you a vector x composed of the components x1, x2, and so on, all the way to xn. So this is an rn. So the norm, which is denoted by these double kind of bracket, these lines, of some vector x, which we enclose with these double kind of lines. So this is the definition of a norm. So symbolically, this is how you write a norm. So the norm of a vector is equal to the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot dot dot. So we just squared each of the components all the way from x1 to xn. And then we just simply take the square root of that. So this is how you calculate the norm of a vector. So that's all there is to it to calculating norm. So there's nothing particularly challenging about this. Now, how do you kind of, you know, characterize this? So how, what are some properties of the norm? So let's go ahead and write down some properties. So some properties. Okay, there isn't too many properties here. So the first one is that the norm of a vector is always bigger than or equal to zero. Intuitively, this should make sense. The norm is the square root of a bunch of, of components, and the square root of a number is always zero or bigger, in the real numbers at least. Okay, so the second one, the norm of a vector is equal to zero if and only if the vector itself is a zero vector. And intuitively, this should again make sense. If even one of these vectors are non-zero, then the square root of something non-zero can never be equal to zero. That doesn't make sense. Even if, for example, if you had the square root of one squared plus negative one squared, that still wouldn't be zero because that's going to be one and that's going to be one. So the square root of this kind of mess is not going to be zero in any way. So as a result, the the norm of a vector can only be zero if the vector itself is a zero vector. Okay, so the next one is, suppose I have some uh, the norm of some scalar t multiplied by some vector x. This is equivalent to the magnitude or the absolute value of that vector, of that scalar, sorry, times the norm of that vector. Now, I should probably make a small kind of note here. This is the absolute value of a scalar. This is the norm of a vector. They're very similar, but there are some very slight differences in the terminology. Nevertheless, take a look here. I'm just saying that if I have a scalar, so if I have a scalar t, I can pull the scalar out and take the absolute value of it and then multiply it by the norm of the vector. So I can just pull out any kind of scalar from a norm. So in this situation, t is a scalar. Okay, so the next one. Technically, I, should I shouldn't be using the real numbers, so t is a scalar. Let me just go ahead and write that down. Okay, the next one is a little bit of a unique situation. This one is the triangle inequality. This one says if I have the norm of x plus y, this is always less than or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. 
Now, the proof of why this works requires something called the Cauchy Stewart's inequality, which is something I'm not going to be doing for a very long time. So I'm going to skip the proof of this inequality. But rest assured that this is definitely something that's uh, valid and intuitively should, you know, make sense. So let me just write that down. So this is known as the triangle inequality. Okay, and as I said, I'll be skipping the proof of this just because the analytical proof of this can be a little bit strange. So I'm not going to spend any kind of time talking about this, the proof of the triangle inequality. I'll do it later, but not right now. Okay, so the next one is the concept of a unit vector. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So a unit vector. Okay, so. If I have some vector v, so v is said to be a unit vector to b and unit vector Let me just fix my writing a little bit. So unit vector if the magnitude of v is equal to 1. So basically, the norm of the vector is equal to 1. So you'll see me interchanging the term, the word magnitude and norm quite often. They both mean the same thing. So I'll be interchanging the terminology whenever I feel like it. Okay, so let's keep going. So essentially, what I'm saying is that if the vector has a magnitude or norm of 1, we call it a unit vector. The unit vector, you could think of it as sort of a, a tool to help us find a direction of a vector of sorts. But let's just go ahead and talk about that a bit later. So let's do a couple of very quick examples. And when I say couple, I mean a little bit more than two. So suppose I have v is equal to minus 5, 3, and 9. So what is the norm? So what is the norm of v? Okay, well, that's that's very simple. So in order to calculate the norm of the vector, I simply go ahead and take the square root of each of the components squared. So it'd be negative 5 squared plus 3 squared plus 9 squared. Okay, so if I go ahead and calculate this, this will give me the square root of 25 plus 9 plus 9. So I'm just go ahead and write that down. So 25 plus, oh, that's, yeah, 25 plus 9 plus 81, sorry. And so that's going to give me the square root of 25 plus 90, which is the same thing as the square root of 150. And that right there is our final answer. So there's nothing too complicated about this. We just literally go ahead and plug it in. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the next one. So this one is... Suppose we give you that, suppose I give you, rather, that j is equal to 0, 1, 0. So in this situation, well, the, the magnitude of j, so let me just explain, write this down. So what is the norm or the magnitude of j? Okay, so this is, again, pretty simple. So the magnitude of j is equal to the square root of 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 0 squared. Okay, but that's just equal to the square root of 1, but the square root of 1 is just 1, so that's just our final answer. This is extremely straightforward. Um, as a side note, because the magnitude is 1, this is a unit vector, because we defined the unit vector to have a magnitude of 1. That was given right there. Okay, let's talk about the next one. Okay, so suppose I give you that w is equal to 3 comma minus 4. So in this situation, what is the norm of w? Okay, well, that's once again pretty straightforward. This time we don't have three components, but that's okay. So in this situation, the norm of w is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus negative 4 squared. Well, that's the same thing as 9 plus 16, but that's just equal to 25. So the square root of 25, well, that's just equal to 5. So the norm of W is just equal to 5, and that's all.
there's nothing too complicated about this. Okay, now the next thing we need to talk about is the concept of normalization. So let me just go ahead and write that down. So normalization. So you might be thinking you might be saying normal and zation, meaning that you might be converting a vector into some kind of different situation. And you are right. So what's going on here is that you're essentially taking a vector and forcing it to make it to become a unit vector. So essentially, I'm allowed to take any vector and convert it to a unit vector by just dividing by its norm or its magnitude. So in other words, so for some vector v, so for some vector v, we can, oh, sorry about that. Let me just zoom back in. So for some vector v, we get, we can convert V, so we just write it down. So for some vector V, we can convert V to a unit vector, which we're gonna call U. So I believe, I, I know they look similar, so we just fix that. So yeah, there we go. So for some vector V, we can convert the vector V to, to a unit vector U by dividing v by the norm of v. So we can divide v by the norm of v. And that's all. So what am I, what am I saying here? You're saying that as some unit vector u is equal to v divided by the magnitude of v. So as I just said, if I take v and I divide by its magnitude or norm, we get some unit vector. Okay, so let's go ahead and do an example of this. So let me just go ahead and take a look at my example right here. So essentially what I'm saying is that given some vector v, I'm allowed to take any vector. It doesn't matter what kind of vector I have. If I take any vector and divide by its magnitude, I will always get a unit vector. So let's take a look at an, an example of this. Okay, let's just scroll down. Okay, so let's take this example. Suppose I give you V is equal to three negative one and minus two. So what I'm saying here is normalize V. So this might seem a little bit of a very ill-defined question because it's so short, but I promise you it's not. So Let's just go ahead and calculate the magnitude because we need that. So the magnitude of v in this situation is equal to 3 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 2 squared. So if we go ahead and do that, let me just fix my writing a little bit. Okay, so if we go ahead and do that, we get 9 plus 10, that's 10, then that's, let's see, we get 14. So we get a square root of 14 as a result. So a unit vector, so the unit vector that corresponds to this vector v would be equal to v divided by its magnitude. Okay, so that means we get 3, negative 1, and negative 2. And then we would simply divide this by its magnitude, which is the square root of 14. So all we do here is we divide each of the components by the square root of 14. So this gives us 3 over the square root of 14 negative 1 over the square root of 14, and minus 2 over the square root of 14. And this right there is our unit vector. You'll see that I use kind of 
different kinds of sets of brackets to do this. Typically in vectors, we usually use a set of straight brackets, kind of like that. But this isn't strictly necessary. Now, I claim that this is a unit vector. Well, how do I know that? Well, we can use the, we can just go ahead and verify this for yourselves. But I promise you that if you take the magnitude of this vector, you will get one. So let's just go ahead and check that. So if I take the magnitude of this vector, I claim that I'll get a unit vector. So the magnitude should be one. Okay, so three over the square root of 14 squared plus negative one over the square root of 14 squared plus negative two over the square root of 14 squared. Okay, so this gives us, let's see, that gives us nine over 14 plus one over 14 plus 4 over 14, and that gives us the square root of 14 over 14, but that's just the square root of 1, which by definition is 1. So this is indeed the correct procedure to normalize any vector I want into a unit vector. So that's great. Okay, now let's talk about a new kind of concept right here. It is always true, and this is a fact, so let me just go ahead and write this down. Any non-zero vector, so let me just clean a few things up. So any non-zero vector uh, there we go is parallel to two unit vectors. Uh, remember that this is the symbol for parallel is parallel to two unit vectors so essentially what i'm saying is the following so let me just go ahead and make sure i'm doing everything correctly Yeah, pretty good. Okay, so any non-zero vectors is parallel to parallel to two unit vectors. So what I'm saying here is essentially that if I have some non-zero vector, it's parallel to one unit vector which goes in the same direction as the original vector, and it's parallel to another vector which goes in the same direction, which goes in the direction, but it's opposite to this uh, original vector. So what do I mean by that? That might seem a little bit confusing. So let me just kind of demonstrate this with an example. So suppose I give you the same vector. So example. So let's just go back up a little bit. And let me just go ahead and copy this vector down. Okay, so suppose I give you v is equal to this vector. Okay. So find a unit vector. That points in the same direction as v. And points in the opposite direction of v. So let me write that down. So points in the same direction uh hold on this thing is pretty there we go same direction as v and points in the opposite direction as v direction as v. Okay, so essentially, any non-zero vector is parallel to two unit vectors. So one of them will be in the same direction and one will be in the other directions. In fact, I'm actually gonna write that fact down specifically above. Um, so let me just write that down up there. One, in the direction of the unit vector
and one in the direction opposite of the unit vector. So one in the opposite. Okay, so that kind of settles this, this situation here. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we need the unit vector, and we actually did that already. We found it, or the magnitude of it, rather. We found that it was equal to the square root of 14. So let's just go ahead and do that. So the magnitude of v was equal to the square root of 14. We actually did, did that a little bit above. So in the same direction, well, in this situation, the, the unit vector, we actually did this question just a moment ago. It's going to be 3 over the square root of 14, negative 1 over the square root of 14, and minus 2 over the square root of 14. Okay, so that's going to be one of the unit vectors. That's going to be in the same direction as the unit vector. And the other one is going to be in the opposite direction. So if we want an opposite vector, well, recall we talked about this in previous video, but if we just want to go in the other direction, we just take the negative of that original vector. So that's going to give us minus 3 over the square root of 14, 1 over the square root of 14, and 2 over the square root of 14. So essentially, one vector, our original vector was going this way along in this direction, and the other one is just going in this direction instead. So it's the same vector, it's just in a different kind of direction, essentially. Okay, so that takes care of that question. So there's nothing too particularly crazy about this. We just have to be a little bit careful about how we use that, that fact we talked about above. So in the same direction, we just go in the direction of u. In the opposite direction, we just go in the direction of negative u. Okay, let's do a few more questions. And this one should be particularly quick. So let's talk about this one. And then last one, we'll talk about the concept of a norm a little bit more geometrically. And then that'll be it for this video. So let's talk about the next question. Okay, so let's talk about this one. So consider the points P is minus 1, 2, and 4, and Q is 3, minus 1, and 7 in three dimensions, because we have three coordinates, uh, we have three sets of coordinates, so, so we have two sets of coordinates, and both of them are three components in each of them. So, of course, we're in R3. So, find the point on the line segment Uh, hold on. Here we go. Okay, so on the line segment connecting the points P and Q which lie or which lies rather two fifth of the way from P to Q. Okay, additionally, find the magnitude. So let me just fix that writing a little bit. Find the magnitude of PQ. Okay, well, if I want to find the magnitude of PQ, well, we just have to go Q minus P and take the magnitude of that vector. So that's simple enough. So the magnitude of PQ is equal to the square root of Q minus P. So it's going to be 3 minus minus 1, minus 1, minus 2, and then 7 minus 4. 
and then of course I square each of those components. So that's going to give me the square root of 34. Okay, so that's the magnitude part done. So how do we do the second part? The second part is a bit harder. So I'm going to let m be that point, which is 2 fifths of the way. So let m, which is x, y, z, be 2 fifths of the way from pq. So I'm going to let this arbitrary point be 2 fifths of that particular distance. So find a point, which I called m, on the line segment, oh, there's a, there's a double line there. That was an accident. On the line segment, connecting the points PQ, which lies two-fifths of the way from P to Q. So two-fifths of PQ is going to be M. So mathematically, all I'm saying is that PM is equal to two-fifths of the way to PQ. So in a more visual kind of sense, this is essentially what this looks like. So let me just go ahead and kind of draw this out. So here's a, here's P, here's M, and here's Q. So that's P, that's M, and that's Q. Okay, so this distance right there is two-fifths of the way from P to Q. So hopefully we can kind of geometrically see what's going on right here. I know that we're in 2D, but let's just pretend it is kind of 3D. So this point right there is minus 1, 2, and 4. This point is x, y, z. And this point right there is 3, minus 1, and 7. Okay, so that's kind of the situation that's going on there. So the distance from P to M, well, that's M minus P. So essentially what we're going to get is x plus 1, y minus 2, z minus 4 is equal to 2 fifths of the way from p to q. So q minus p, so that's 3 minus minus 1, so that's 4 minus 3 and 3. Okay, so if I kind of compare these components term by term, we're going to get x plus 1 is equal to 8 over 5 y minus 2 is equal to minus 6 over 5, and z minus 4 is equal to 6 over 5. So as a result, we can directly solve for each of these components, and we get that x, y, and z, respectively, are equal to 3 over 5, 4 over 5, 26 over 5. So this will be the point that is two-fifths of the way from P to Q. And we're done. So hopefully that made sense. Intuitively, this should make sense from the drawing, but if it doesn't, feel free to leave something in the comments and I'll be happy to answer. Now, we have more or less finished everything. Now, there's one last thing I gotta talk about, and that's kind of the geometric interpretation of norm. This one is a very short section, so we don't have to do too much here. Essentially, all I'm saying is that we can interpret the idea of a norm by simply just considering the Pythagorean theorem of some kind. So let me just go ahead and draw a triangle. And to be very clear, I'm actually going to erase this thing and draw a right angle triangle using a much shorter kind of axis like that. Okay, so let's just draw a triangle. And here we go. Okay, and let's just go ahead and draw a line going down. That's going to go from here. And let's see, that's going to go here. Okay, so let's call this vector right here. Oops, I just undo that. Give me a second. Okay, let's call this distance from here to here, let's call that V1. Let's call this distance V2. So by the definition of the Pythagorean theorem, this distance right there, the hypotenuse of this triangle, is the square root 
of v1 squared plus v2 squared. But by definition, that is the norm. So the magnitude of v is the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared. So you can think of the idea of a norm as a n-dimensional Pythagorean theorem. Of course, in three dimensions, we use three components. In four dimensions, we use four components, and so on and so on. So you can think of the, the idea of a norm as a n-dimensional Pythagorean theorem. This isn't necessarily 100% accurate, but you can kind of interpret this geometrically this way at least, the, the idea of a norm. So this is how you kind of interpret this. And aside from that, we have now more or less finished the idea of norm. So that card, that is it for this video. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment your question and I'll be happy to answer as soon as I can. But otherwise, if this video helped you, please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. We're almost at 900 subscribers and almost 1,000. So I'm very excited to achieve that milestone. So if you could please share my video around and my channel around, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so I will see you all in the next video. Have a great day.